Hey everybody, welcome back to another presentation in our series on HIE and cooling in the NICU. So this week we have Brooke Rakes, who is a PhD prepared registered nurse from a NICU in San Diego, and she's going to present to you her findings from her dissertation. So when she was working on her PhD, she decided that she wanted to look at the demographics of the babies getting cooled in her unit and also their short-term outcomes, whether that was MRI, seizures, or developmental outcomes. This is just such a great example of nursing research as well as just how you can dig into the data at your hospital and be able to provide better care in your hospital. So I hope you'll enjoy this presentation by Brooke. She was with us at our 2021 Virtual One Conference. And if you'd like to download slides and other resources related to this presentation, go ahead and either scan the QR code here on the screen or click the link in the show notes below so that you can get access to those. All you have to do is enter your name and your email and we'll send those right out to you. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button. It helps us out a lot and allows us to bring you more free content. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this presentation by Dr. Brooke Rakes. I choose Singleton and they were born at a single medical center between November 1st, 2012 to March 31st, 2020. So I didn't want to have to deal with the various timing issues of infants who are born at outlier hospitals and then brought in for cooling because that was just a whole nother mess of trying to get all of those data because sometimes they um, are started on cooling at the referring facility, other times on transport. And for inclusion, I only included singleton infants and that becomes more important statistically based on certain tests. You have to meet certain assumptions. And so I wanted my infants to be, or cases to be independent of each other. So I just decided to exclude those and keep it simple for the inborn infants at this one facility. And within this organization, we do cool infants in the 35 week um, gestation. So they had to be at least 35 weeks or greater, less than seven hours old, no uncontrolled bleeding and no disorder incompatible with survival. And then I only included infants who received complete TH and rewarming via the unit standard machine. There was a small, maybe I think a few cases we were trialing a different machine and I didn't want to have to account for any of the variability between machines. So I decided to exclude those infants. Other exclusions, so if they didn't meet one of the above criteria, if they were transferred or deceased prior to completing TH, I excluded them. And then if they have any um, confounding conditions, which from my literature review, I just looked at what other studies had published and that would be considered congenital brain malformations diagnosed on neonatal MRI. They had congenital anomalies, congenital chromosomal or genetic disorders and or metabolic diseases. For my data source, so currently within this organization, they already have these two first report created. So I was able to utilize those. So the first one, is the NICU critical cord gas report. So that identifies all infants greater than 35 weeks with an abnormal cord gas or infant gas within the first hour of life. And the next is our NICU cooling candidate screen report. So this organization's um, baby baby, they call them cooling candidates and they screen for those first six hours. Also this report includes not only all the candidates and the screenings, but also if the decision was made to receive therapeutic hypothermia, did they get admitted for another reason or were they transferred back up with their mom or family? And then for the third data source, I used the perinatal database. So this collects maternal, perinatal and delivery record variables within the hospital. So the first two I combined and I used those to identify initial case selection and then I matched them with the perinatal database variables. And then some of my timing type variables of teach and things like that, I had to manually go in for each case and collect those variables. So all my independent variables would be my maternal factors, the infant clinical characteristics and the teach timing and then short term outcomes or neonatal seizures and brain injury. And for purposes of this study, my outcome was dichotomous, meaning it was either, did they have seizures? Yes or no. Did they have brain injury consistent with HIE? Yes or no. And for my analytic approach, I conducted descriptive and inferential statistics to address the study aims. And I used a software for statistics called SPSS and the version was 25. And the significance level, so when they say this is statistically significant, that level will set at the standard, which is an alpha of 0.05. So 
So for the first aim, I looked at means, medians, and standard deviations for continuous data and percentages and frequencies for categorical data. For my second aim, I looked at independent t-tests and man went to tests were examined continuous relationships and chi-squared analysis was used to examine potential categorical associations. And then I wanted to continue on to address aim three, which I would have used logistic regression. However, due to a limited sample size and the identification of rare events, further analysis was not performed. And we'll go into more detail later about what that really means. So for my first aim, I had just describing eligibility and exclusion. So I assessed 178 cases. And then from that, I had to exclude 62. So I, there was one infant case early on that was treated with um, therapeutic hypothermia for hyperpyrexia, but it was, it came up in our reports. So that one I had to exclude. So they were treating that baby for fever with the cooling machine, not for HIE. Another four infants received that trial machine that was going on in the unit, so I excluded those. I had six with compounding conditions, and then I had three that either passed or were transferred to another facility prior to completing TH. I did have one set of twins, and then I had 46 that were screened during those six hours that weren't actually decided to be cooled, so um, I didn't include those, which left me with 116 to analyze. So for my results, so for the maternal age, it looked like the mean or the average age was around 30 and a half years old. Most of the women in my study, let's see, the highest percentage was white, followed by Hispanic. Next were Asian, and then 7.1% were Black or African American, and 4.5% were other, or they declined or didn't want to specify. As far as insurance, the majority at 67% had, let's see, private, and then followed by Medi-Cal, and then 26 had some other type of governmental insurance. And then almost all at 94.8% of the cases had some type of prenatal care visits of four or more. And then other factors around 48%, this is the mother's first pregnancy, and the most common reason for the hospital visit was contractures, pressure, and or pain. They were in active labor, induction of labor due to a medical condition. And then about 11% came in for spontaneous rupture of membranes. 9.5% came in for a fetal condition. About 6% came in for a maternal condition. And then only 5.2% came in for an elective C-section or an elective induction. For the infants, the median gestational age at birth was around 39 and a half weeks. 61% um, of the infants were male, and the mean birth weight was about 3.24 kilos. And the mean arterial umbilical cord gas, pH, was a 6.96, with a base excess mean of negative 15. So you can tell pretty acidotic blood gas results for the average there. As far as APGARs, I did collect each individually, but also I made if it's less than six at 10 minutes, that was pretty um, abnormal. And it was almost an even split with half being abnormal at the 10 minute mark. For delivery mode, most of the babies were delivered via C-section with 61%, followed by vaginal. And then we had a few with an assisted vaginal and even a smaller percentage with assisted C-section. And then as far as a vaginal delivery post C-section or like a VBAC, most of these were not applicable or attempted. And then meconium was present in about 57% of the cases. And the mean for the number of hours of ruptured of membranes before birth was almost 11 hours that they were ruptured. And the mean lactate for the first value for these infants was around 9.79. And cord gases were completed in almost all cases at 94%. So that's pretty good. Other infant um, characteristics as far as resuscitation, almost all of the infants required some form of resuscitation. So it looks like only 3.4% required no intervention whatsoever. However, the majority of the infants required PPV, followed by 39% required intubation plus PPV. And only about 10% of these infants required intubation, ventilation, plus medication like 
happy or normal saline. As far as discharge, 95.7% of these infants got to go home with their family. Another smaller percentage at 1.7% transferred to the children's hospital, which is lever four or about 2.6, even after completing TH passed. And as far as the different categories of groups that I created as far as changes over time for the unit. So from 2012 to 2015, all of our infants, if they met criteria, were cooled right away, standardized. Then in 2016, we implemented a maybe baby program, which we call our cooling screening or cooling candidates. So I divided those up. So I had the screening in one group, which made about 17.2% of the kids that were cooled. And then also the other group was about half of my total um, sample for my study. And that was those from 2016 to 2020 who met criteria right away for cooling. As far as timing, so the mean or the average initiation time was 114 minutes, um, but the range from anywhere was 19 minutes to 396 minutes of life, so quite a big range there. And the mean time to target temperature was 96.3 you know, minutes, and also this had a wide range where some babies took 15 minutes to reach target temperature and others it took 145 minutes. As far as the short-term outcomes, just looking at the percentage, we only had 18 infants, which was 15.5% who experienced seizures and only 21.6% of infants demonstrated evidence of brain injury consistent with HIV. So compared to the, what I found out in other studies in the literature, that's well below what's published. Um, however, within this organization, they do cool um, I feel like quite a few of their screening infants do qualify and do get cooled. So they do cool a lot more mild infants. So my second aim was to examine the relationships among all of these variables. For neonatal seizures, I found a statistically significant association between seizures and infant gender, disposition at discharge, and brain injury. Also, infants with neonatal seizures had higher initial lactates and lower or more acidic arterial blood gas pH values. And infants with neonatal seizures required fewer minutes to reach target temperature. As far as infants with brain injury, that was significantly associated with disposition at discharge, infant mortality, and neonatal seizures. And then infants with brain injury compared to those without had higher initial lactate values and also lower and more acidic blood gas pH values. I broke up some of the timing variables into groups. So early, I defined as if they received TH within 60 minutes of life. And so those infants did have higher initial lactate values compared to those in the late group, which would be those receiving TH after 61 minutes and on up to six hours. And for target temperature, I did within range, which we want them to reach target temperature within 90 minutes. So for those babies, they also had higher initial lactate values and lower mean birth weights, which kind of makes sense if they're a little bit smaller baby, there's less body mass to try to cool. And then for AIM-3, I wanted to do logistic regression is known to suffer from small sample bias with a degree of bias strongly based on the number of cases in the less frequent of two categories. So if you remember, my both of my outcomes were categorical in the sense that it was either you have injury or you don't, you have a seizure or you don't. And both of my outcomes of interest were very low in this sample, which is good for the babies, very happy, but you can't do a lot um, statistically with that. So due to that, I just didn't move forward because it wouldn't have been very helpful. As far as discussion, infants with annual seizures and their brain injury had more acidotic cord and blood gas results, as well as higher initial lactates than those without neonatal seizures and their brain injury. And I think that wasn't very surprising. The study did demonstrate the importance of TH timing, specifically time to target, as infants with seizures required significantly less time to reach target temperature. A greater understanding of cord and blood gas results, initial lactates, and target temperatures may increase the nurse's ability to anticipate complications. And future research related to timing and infant outcomes that I'm interested in in the future, specifically looking at nursing and developmental interventions and outcomes of these infants with HIE, 
family involvement and holding and how that plays a factor, long-term follow-up, and also how NICN programs, the linkage between quality cost and access. Of course, like any studies, my study has to be viewed in the context of several limitations. So I was only available data was dependent on the EHR and how people charted and when they charted. And that's, there's always potential for subjectivity of documentation. I can't control for that. And it was a single site, single unit, non-randomized study. So there's gonna be limitations related to generalizability. Some lessons learned. So whether you're looking to get involved in research or EDP or QI um, on your unit, it's good to know who the stakeholders and the gatekeepers are, whether it's an educator or your CNS, um, your manager, but just getting to know those people and how they can help you and help propel you. What you have access to um, within your workplace or wherever you're planning to do a project is really important to find out ahead of time as soon as possible. Um, as far as measurement, how are these variables and these metrics being collected? How are they defined? Like I said, working with the EHR, some items are manually charted and cannot be easily pulled into a report or by a data analyst, whereas others are. So just really looking at how are things measured. As far as being realistic, it may be that you're just one person and you have a small team. Maybe you don't have funding or a large budget. Are you gonna get paid for out time to do these types of projects? So those are all things to consider and keep in mind. And as far as navigation, I had to learn a lot related to IRB. So our organization has an IRB to protect human subjects and their rights and their privacy related to their protected health information. So really navigating that process and the stakeholders and gatekeepers can help navigate that for you, as well as what does the unit look like or the organization, how supportive are they of these types of projects. And then time management being realistic and that was something I had to learn a lot along the way, this trying to balance work, life, and being in school all full time. And just a lot of self-motivation. I try to think back on my passion, which is HIE infants and NEMO care in general, and kind of coming back to why I started this process to begin with, because that can help you through the hard times and the hard areas. And then also just being flexible. I think with COVID, we've all had to pivot or become flexible, maybe make some changes in other areas of our life. And that can be true of any type of EVP or QI or research study is having that flexibility where things may come up and you might have to do something a little different that you hadn't planned originally. And I just want to say thank you. And we can probably open it up um, to questions. That was great, Brooke. Thank you. An incredible amount of work and insight. It looks like I see one question. So one is shorter time to target temperature on seizure kids. Was that correlated with more severe injury on MRI or did you not look at injury on MRI? That was from Shannon. Yeah. So for the infants with seizures, so they required less time to reach target temperature. However, when I looked at target temperature with brain injury on MRI, there was nothing significant. Otherwise I would have reported it. So it was just separate, which I, when I looked at other studies and what they had found and similar to what people have talked about today, it sounds like the more severe HIE or some studies have found that more resuscitation at birth, they've also required less time to reach target temperature or have cooled faster. And so I think a lot of us have hit on that today where Maybe the more milder kids are more active. They're biting the blanket. They might need more sedation. The sicker kids, they aren't doing as much. So it's not as hard to cool them. And so I think that's consistent. It just depends on statistically your numbers and how many are in each group will also influence all of that. But that part was consistent. Great. Thank you. Other questions? I'm just impressed by... Rochelle, last week and you this week, the amount of time and energy that you guys put into working in the unit and doing like caring for patients and staff nurses in the unit and then family and home life and finding the time to figure out how to do all of this research and PhD work. I'm very much in all of you guys who have the dedication and the willpower to to get through it all. So it's very impressive. It's definitely helpful having a buddy 
to our whole cohort in, in general to bounce ideas off of, and we're all in it together. So that helped, but yeah, being like a little bit out now, I'm feeling a little bit more refreshed, but yeah, I'm still, people are always like, what's next? And I'm like, well, I'd like to take a break, spend some time with family, do some things that I'm interested in, but I have some other things in the works that I, I'm hopefully planning on working on later. So that's exciting too. Do you plan to continue some of this work that you've started or and done for your PhD, continuing that in your unit at all? Yeah, so I think I touched on it with my AIM-3 where I wasn't really able to continue to do um, logistic regression and there are other types of statistical tests that we didn't learn about in our program for rare events that you can do. So I'm looking at just trying to learn more about them. So each program has like their own school of thought, but my chair who guides what you should do when like decisions like that need to be made is the school of thought if we didn't really learn about it don't necessarily use it for your dissertation, but it can be something that you can do after the fact. So I'm planning on reaching out to a data analyst and a statistician to learn more about that and hopefully take my data and just keep going with it. Hopefully your hospital helps support. I know different institutions have different support for their staff continuing that. And I think too, had I known at the beginning that I was gonna get the scholarships and the funding, and just the timing of when I got it, I had already been approved for my proposal a certain way. So had I known I was going to get a grant that I ended up getting, had I known that COVID was going to happen and I wasn't going to be able to use that money to go to conferences and other things, I probably would have just paid an analyst to create one big report. So I didn't have to go into like almost 200 HR to collect some of those variables. So There's always things looking back after the fact, but yeah, if I could have solidified that funding, that's where one of those lessons learned is if there's something you can apply for ahead of time, that helps so much if you can access that. And if you can't, then you have to have a plan and just be realistic about manpower and what you can do. And I had to consider that I have all these big ideas, right? And then you have to funnel it down to what's realistic for the timeframe also, because I wanted to graduate on time, so. Lauren, it's Jane. Congratulations, Brooke, and to Rochelle also, who I think is um, in, typing in the chat. But I was just curious, other than this platform where Cappy does such a great job of having us all present our work, what other opportunities do you all have to share this kind of work? I just feel like neonatologists have these PAS meeting and brain society meetings, but other than through this platform, how do you get that out there? I know through, yeah, publishing Rochelle put as well, Yeah, a, yeah. Few, a few physicians have asked me for some things and I've told them in the nicest way possible, well, you can wait till my dissertation's published for that info, but also through my scholarships, they've asked me to come back a couple different times. So during COVID, I made a few different videos for them and the ARCS is one that's, I have a San Diego chapter, but it's also national and through my organization as well. I've presented, we have a research and innovation council, and then I'm presenting to our Nikon narrow group. I presented my proposal last July, and I'll present my findings similar to this present presentation this upcoming July. And then I also presented a poster at WIN. So there's lots of opportunities like that. But yeah, I think you have to, just like this, networking, kind of putting yourself out there a little bit more. Thank you. I just feel like nurses have so much good work that they do whether it be through a one methodology page or through a huge dissertation like you did, we are the gold of what makes the unit tick. And I just, I personally never want to miss what's going on. It's a great job. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Brooke and and got inspired by how you could do some nursing research in your hospital. Many thanks to, to Lauren and to the others who were there contributing to this workshop. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out a lot and tells YouTube that you like videos like this and helps others to see them too. So this month is January, 2024, and you have four different presentations, two by physicians and two by nurses, all about different care practices related to HIE. If you have missed any of the others, go back to our homepage on our YouTube channel and click through to the other videos in this series. So if you want some resources, go ahead and either scan the QR code here on the screen or click the link in the show notes below and you'll be taken to um, a page where you can download the resources right away. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation by Brooke and that we will see you on the next one. Okay, bye.